Oratory and Member Board. And on this note, please welcome Honorable Minister Williams. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You so much. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Wow, no man. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Iveta. Thank you for the introduction. Let me say how delighted I am to be here today. Um, I'm here along with my team, and I'll just introduce them quickly to you. Dr. Kassan Troop, our Chief Education Officer for Jamaica. Um, I'm here as well with Mr. Gart Anderson, Principal of Churches Teachers College and President of the Teachers Colleges of Jamaica. Uh, Mr. Howard Isaacs, Principal of Mani College. Dr. Ashburn Pinnock, he's the President and Principal of the Michael University College. Dr. Derek Deslandis, President of um, the Agricultural Science Education uh, College. Ms. Dorit Campbell, Interim, princip Interim Principal of Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. And I have Dr. Felicia Marshall, Assistant Chief Education Officer for the Tertiary Unit. And of course, Dr. Clover Hamilton Flowers, our Acting Deputy Chief Education Officer, Curriculum and Support Services from the Ministry of Education and Youth. And of course, this is, was made possible by the U.S. Embassy of Jamaica, and we have with us Mr. Alex Sokoloff, Political Economic Counselor, Mr. Robert Adelson, Public Affairs Officer, and Mr. Mike Riley, Office Management Specialist. Thank you so much, U.S. Embassy, for making this trip possible, and thank you to ASU for hosting us. And I want to specially mention Ms. Megan Gibson, Program Manager, Global Outreach and Extended Education for helping to organize this trip for us. She's considered our delegation host and logistics coordinator. Thank you so much. It's been a full day so far for us, and I would characterize it as being engaging, validating, and inspiring. Thank you for the trip today out to sea um, to get a sense of your uh, high school, your middle school, and um, just all the things that happened there. So again, I'm delighted to be here at the Arizona State University, along with my delegation. And um, you know, let me express special thanks for the hospitality extended to us, for the opportunity to share our experience and perspective on the Jamaican education system and the specific actions taken amidst the COVID-19 pandemic to allow for the continuation of teaching and learning. Uh, we're not as endowed as you are here in the US, so you can imagine when the pandemic hit us, uh, you know, we had to, to really uh, get going very quickly in order to enable our children to continue with their uh, learn, the teaching and learning experience. But just before I get into that, I just want to give you a context for education in Jamaica. Education is managed um, primarily by the Ministry of Education and Youth through its central ministry. We have regional offices in Jamaica, so there are seven regions. Each has a head, a, 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 you know, a regional director. Uh, we have departments and agencies at the ministry. Our education system consists of four levels uh, there, early childhood, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Education uh, in Jamaica, unlike here, um, once our children leave primary school, they go straight to high school, so there's no middle school. So our high school starts at grade seven, and um, we're going all the way up to grade 13 now. Used to be grade 11, um, you know, for the majority of our children. We also partner with churches, trusts, uh, as well as uh, independent or private schools. So within our education sector, you have um, just a number of stakeholders in the sector. When you look at Jamaica, just in terms of our population, 2.9 million. Um, if you compare that to what you have here in Arizona, I think we're less than a half of your population in Arizona. You have about 7.1 million persons here. 
Um, it's interesting that uh, you have, I think, some 1,200 schools here, if Google is, Google is correct. I, I, <laughs> I, I looked it up. In Jamaica, we do have about a thousand uh, public institutions, primary and high school. Add to that about 3,000 early childhood institutions as well, small, but they're dotted all over Jamaica. We have about 600,000 students from early childhood all the way through to high school and some 25,000 teachers in Jamaica. Uh, of course, the history of education dates way, 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 way back. But in terms of it being more formalized, I think we can go back to our independence in 1962, um, you know, when things really got formal in terms of putting in legislation, having teachers' colleges, having a well-structured education system. We do have public universities and several community colleges there as well multidisciplinary, and of course, our teachers' colleges. And for this trip, we particularly are focusing on teachers' colleges. And so we brought the representatives here, the presidents of the various teachers' colleges, because we know that um, our teachers are probably the most important component of, of education. Uh, they are in the classroom for many, many hours with our students, whether physically or virtually. And it's that interaction that will either ignite the student or you know, send them in a different direction. So we, we know that our teachers are extremely important and we want to ensure that uh, they get the best that is available so that they can operate uh, optimally in the classroom. Um, over a number of years, our education system in Jamaica has been the subject of many, many studies. Because we, while we have, um, you know, we have access, full access to everyone now, it wasn't the case 20 years ago, but now all of our children uh, born in Jamaica have access to school from uh, preschool all the way through high school. Um, but what we're grappling with, with right now is just the quality of education. And you know that that is the SDG number four. Um, globally, quality of education and continuing education throughout one's lifetime. So while we can claim victory in terms of access, all of our students have a space in primary, well, in the early childhood, in primary and in high school, the quality of education is, is where our concern is right now. Um, the World Bank did a study recently on Jamaica. Uh, we're now proud of the results. Uh, we know we accept them because we know that they do good study. And it says, on average, Jamaicans complete about 11.7 years of schooling. Uh, but um, when you look at it, it's only equivalent to about 7.2 years uh, in, you know, against the benchmark. So there's a learning gap of about 4.3 years. That was before the pandemic. So you can imagine now with the pandemic, uh, that would have widened that gap. And so we have to run uh, a little faster than everybody else. Uh, we have to run a little longer in order to get our children up to that benchmark level. So when the pandemic hit, and you know that was for us, that was in March of 2020, March of 2020. Um, I came to the education ministry in September of 2020. All our children were at home doing however, however they were able to manage during that time. And um, because I sit in the cabinet as well, I'm privy to all the discussion with regards to uh, what was happening on the health side of things, how the health minister was thinking about the pandemic, how his, how his technical people, what kind of projections they were looking at, what was their forecast. And so we knew that we had to hunker down for this pandemic. And we started immediately in September when I got there to ramp up in a very significant way government's purchase of devices so we could have our children have devices. We launched as well two other programs, one called the One Laptop or Tablet Per Child Initiative. We called on all our private sector entities, our diaspora, 
to come on board and help us. And then we also launched another program called Own Your Own Device. And this was for, for families that may not be as needy as the ones that the government would give a, a device to, but they were needy as well. So we gave an electronic voucher so they could go and get a device for their students. And we did that. We ramped that up in just really short order so that um, the majority of our children could have access in the online world to education. Um, we, have, we, we can't necessarily uh, claim victory just yet because not every child has a device, but I believe at last count of the 400,000 students who are in primary and high school, I know we were well over halfway there and continuing for, for those children, even though they're back in the face-to-face -face environment. The objective is to ensure that all of our students have a device, then that all of our teachers as well, and we're just moving now to equip our teachers. We've already equipped about 95% of the teachers in our primary schools with laptops, and now we're moving on to the high school to do something similar. But of course, we recognize that um, a device is only one, one you know, variable in this uh, looking at this um, you know, technology uh, space in which we're operating. And so there was a massive effort as well to ensure that our schools are so equipped. And we began that uh, during the pandemic and are continuing that even now. Eventually, in a year or so, all of our schools in Jamaica should be equipped with broadband connectivity so that technology can continue to be a permanent part of the education system in Jamaica. Um, you know, I often say, yes, we had a pandemic. That was the bad news. The good news is that all our students and our teachers would have come back to school with, new, with a new skill in, in technology, right? They, they learned how to navigate uh, the virtual world uh, while they were at home. Uh, they, they have skills that we want them to to continue to learn more about. We don't want them to forget it, that they're in the classroom. So we're encouraging technology in our classrooms. We just recently finalized our technology and education policy, which is guiding us as we go along. And so we, would, we, we did all of the things I believe other countries did in terms of devices, making sure that if you didn't have access you would get your textbooks and workbooks as well at home. Uh, we did all of those. We had teachers going out into the communities, dropping off, touching bases. Um, and you know, we ensured that our teachers had connectivity. Uh, you know, we, we paid for it for the most part for them so that they were able to be at home and connect if they didn't have connectivity at home to come to the school and, and teach from there. So I think overall, when, when we look back and, and look at the assessment of the pandemic, we did as best as we could within our budgets to ensure that our children remained learning. And I always have to say uh, for our teachers, I always have to commend them because they were able to pivot very quickly uh, to learn how to navigate in the online space. And uh, I think it's a great skill for us to have now in Jamaica that we can leverage on as, as we go forward. Um, so, so we did all of that during the pandemic, just as, as other countries do. And when a couple of days ago in uh, New York at the Transforming Education Summit, as we sat and listened to ministers of education from around the world as to what they did during the pandemic and where they're heading, um, we, we were sitting there just thinking, yes, uh, there's quite a bit of validation for what we did and how we're thinking as we emerge um, from the pandemic here. So here we are in the face-to-face -face world. Our school year began September 5, and we're in the second week of the school year. All of our children are back, um, we believe. Uh, but come next week, we'll begin to really assess uh, how many are back in school. Because if they're not physically back, we're going to go out and try to find them. So we're identifying 
based on school records, who is in and who is out. And we have a fi you know, uh, Find the Child initiative uh, that we did uh, earlier on this year that we will continue in this new school year. Because uh, unfortunately, despite the access that children have to education in Jamaica, on any school day, um, roughly 20, 15 to 20 percent of our students are absent from school, and that is about twice the world average. And that is something that we would like to significantly reduce, because if you're not in class, it's unlikely that you'll be getting the teaching and learning that you're supposed to get. So that will be a big initiative going forward for us. Um, to increase the attendance at school. We know that there are many, many issues in the way uh, why, why children do not attend school or those who don't attend regularly. And um, we have to use this Find the Child initiative to, to get at the, some of those reasons. It could be because the parent uh, does not have the financial resources to send the child to school because in our rural areas of Jamaica, transportation is very expensive. Whereas in the city, transportation is highly subsidized by the government. In rural areas, parents have to find that. And it's very expensive. And a lot of times, you know, that's the reason persons, parents sometimes say they don't send their child to school because of uh, transportation or uh, lack of lunch money. Um, or, or other things. But these are things that we have to solve as a ministry, as a government, because we want all of our children to be in school. Education is very important um, to us in Jamaica, and it's, I'm not just standing here saying that. When you look at the investment in education relative to our GDP or relative to our national budget, um, it's very significant. So as a percent of our national budget, if you look at the non-debt component of it, it's about 20% of that. And that compares well regionally, internationally. In terms of our GDP, about between 4 to 5% of our GDP as well, and that, that compares well. Um, I know our GDP is not as large as we would like it to be. Um, over time, you know, it will grow, and therefore education will get more um, from the budget, but that's where it stands right now, and it's comparable, as I said, regionally and internationally. Um, so there's a real commitment to, um, on the part of government, successive governments, to, to education. And during the pandemic, um, while other areas would have seen uh, cutbacks or delays, uh, you know, or reallocation of funds, for the education budget that was sacrosanct. Uh, there were no reallocation away from that budget, no cuts, um, because we know that uh, for us to see meaningful growth in our economy, we have to keep strengthening education so we have an educated population uh, that can go into some of these newer jobs that are coming, that are being created, technology jobs, cybersecurity, uh, those areas we want or, or want an educated population to be there. So coming out of the pandemic, we, we recognized uh, the learning loss that happened. And so uh, we looked at the students who were at the point where they would be leaving high school, grade 11. Um, we created an additional two years of high school for those students and all those who are behind them. The thinking was that it would give them time to recover, but it would also give them great skills in those two years so that they're in a better position for the world of work or even for tertiary. Um, so in Jamaica, just to transition to the tertiary sector, about a third of the students who graduate from high school make it to tertiary. Um, the other two-thirds, they may find um, some programs that exist in our system. They may go on to, to other institutions, but it was not really, uh, you know, formalized for them. They were kind of on their own to search for opportunities. So over the last couple of years, we formalized two additional years of high school 
for our students. So now it's grade 12 and 13, which give them a chance to become more skilled uh, and that they give them a chance to leave uh, the education system with certification in something, because that is really big. When we look at our working age population in Jamaica, the level of certification is quite, quite low, and we want to see that number increasing. So doing, uh, you know, putting programs like those out will help us in terms of that regard. We're delighted um, this year when we started the two additional years of high school, um, we had some 17,000 students sign up for it, pre-register and, and, and started to, to attend. Uh, we're seeing uh, you know, good acceptance of the program. Uh, many, would have, many thought that our students would not want to do an, an additional two years in high school, um, but we've proved them wrong. Our students have come on board in a significant way uh, to do these additional two years. And, we will continue to work with our principals. Uh, we want to uh, rope in or we have roped in our community colleges. We do have community colleges in Jamaica. And in cases where the high school does not have the space to accommodate the students, we are facilitating those students at community colleges as well. Um, early days, but we are so encouraged by this. Um, you have no idea how encouraged we are, because otherwise you would have 16-year-olds turning 17, turning 18, just kind of wandering around in life. And to have formalized this and you know, making it a part of the education system has been um, a rewarding experience for all of us that are involved with this. We want as well to have TVET, the Technical Vocational Education, become uh, a more respected part of the education system. Uh, right now, uh, there is a dichotomy where people value more the straight academics, and they kind of look uh, you know, down a little bit on, on students who do the TVET subjects. And we are saying, and we're putting our money behind it, that. Um, it should be on par with straight academics as well, because you could go all the way to a PhD in TVET, which is what we want our, our students to take on. And, and so we, are, uh, we continue to, to partner with those schools that offer that, and um, as I said, put some PR and communication behind it so that we begin to, to build a better awareness for technical and vocational education in Jamaica. So we have a lot of things going on. We're excited about education. Um, on this trip, we bought our principals from our teachers' colleges because we also want to ensure that our teachers uh, become energized and excited about the, what they're doing as well. And we know that if we get our leaders from our teachers' colleges here, to hear about all the great things that you're doing, the innovation that they can take back um, quite a bit of what they'd be exposed to here. Additionally, beyond just taking that back, uh, there are opportunities, uh, many opportunities for us to partner with ASU and um, you know, to, 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 to learn from you in terms of some of the things that you are doing as well. So I'm hoping that um, the delegation that's with me, that they're feeling the same way. Uh, Mr. Isaacs, Mr. Pinnock, I hope, you, I hope you're feeling the same way as well, because we want to also raise the stature of our teachers in Jamaica. Uh, we want it uh, teaching to be restored once again to that profession um, where people are excited to be in. Yes, I know like other countries, we have the issue of uh, the level of, of remuneration of teachers. But in time, I know our Minister of Finance and the Public Service, they're going through a massive look at public sector wages. And in time, I'm sure we will see some movement there. There are many conversations happening now um, with all the labor unions in Jamaica. But I know that there is a real uh, understanding of um, you know, where we, the remuneration is for different groups in Jamaica right now. 
uh, our teachers' colleges are going to be vastly important going forward to ensure that um, our new teachers coming into the system, that they are technology ready, technology savvy, they can operate in a hybrid environment or a remote environment, a virtual environment, all of that, that they have the new thinking coming in and that they're ready when they walk into our schools um, to, to meet the students where they are and to help them along their various pathways. Um, I know we have about seven teachers colleges in Jamaica. Seven, right, Dr. Chu? Ten. Hmm? Ten. Ten, ten teachers colleges in Jamaica. Um, and they're all uh, very well, highly regarded. And we want them to even be more highly regarded. We want them to be overflowing with teachers coming in and um, for our teachers to have specialization uh, going out in maths, science, uh, the you know, technology, all those areas that are important in our schools. Um, so is there an area in which we're, you know, we'd love to do more in? Yes, if we look at the infrastructure of our schools, uh, we, and we look at the investment in infrastructure, we lag um, other Caribbean nations and we lag the rest of the world in terms of how much we invest in infrastructure in our schools. So if there's an area that I, I will continue to advocate for, it's that. Um, the look and feel of our schools need, need to be improved, or labs, and so on. Um, just a lot of work uh, needs to be done there. And so that's an area, again, that um, you know, we have to make greater investment in. And I will continue to ensure that we get more and more budget space in order for us to be able to do so. Our students at the top, they compare very well with anybody else in the rest of the world in terms of their brilliance and so on. Um, the problem is in Jamaica, we don't have enough of them. So you have you know, the 10% that's just way out there doing very well. And then the majority of students kind of doing okay. And then there's a segment that's behind. We have to bring everybody up to a level um, because we need all of our citizens in Jamaica to be operating at a high level, because then we can expect to see the results in our economy, in higher um, economic growth rates, and in terms of the jobs that people can have, and ultimately the quality of life that they will have in Jamaica. I know right now, uh, given the, the pandemic and the massive shifts that we're seeing in the workforce all across the world, we too in Jamaica are grappling with um, uh, just the lore from the US of our teachers from Jamaica. Um, so we're going to have to train, train more, uh, train our teachers faster, get them into our schools so that we can continue to replenish um, our stock of teachers in our school. We have to think as well uh, about other models to see how creative we can be to work with entities like ASU to see if we can wrap our heads around getting ahead of this trend rather than just reacting to it, um, but embrace it and, and, and see how we can make it work for us as well. Um, so those are, those are some of the things as we sit and listen uh, here that we are gonna take back and we know that we have to work on um, when we get back to Jamaica. So ladies and gentlemen, I am going to leave some time for questions. And so I'm going to end there right now and uh, we'll open it up for questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Uh, the question I would like to pose to you is, as the ministry, how do you handle like, the social uh, emotional learning of children because I don't know whether it is a stereotype, uh, like we all, I always read like many stories about Jamaica, and, like, so how do you handle the social, emotional well-being of students in your country? Then, two, 
uh, what is the government's input in, in as far as special needs education is concerned in your country? Thank you. Thank you so much for those two questions. In terms of the socioeconomic learning, this is new to us, um, and we would have seen it more coming out of the pandemic. In our schools, we do have um, guidance counselors that help with that. Um, and we're recognizing it more and more as an important component of the teaching and learning process. Um, and so I know that we have to build out our capabilities or skills in order to help our children. They come to us from different backgrounds, different households. They come with different issues into the classroom. And so we have to equip our teachers first to be able to um, allow them to, to spot the issues, to respond in the classroom setting where they cannot, uh, you, know, you know, where they get to their limit in terms of their capabilities. We do have guidance counselors, primarily in our high schools, not so much yet in our primary schools. And if our guidance counselors, after, you know, uh, trying, if they can't, uh, if they get to the limit of their capabilities as well, we do have professionals on call uh, that, that we pay for as a ministry, that these students, their parents, can have access to those professionals as well to help them. But I know on an ongoing basis, we have to have that as a permanent part of our curriculum, uh, of our training, so that our teachers would understand more how to deal with children who um, you know, have these socioeconomic learning issues when they show up in classrooms. Hope that answers the question. In terms of special needs, uh, I am particularly pleased that over the years, the Ministry of Education has invested in providing for special needs students. And I do have our chief education officer here who has a lot more of the details on it. Dr. Chub, I'm going to invite you just to give a sense of what we do now in terms of the special needs offering that we have in the system. Thank you so much, Minister. Good afternoon, everyone. So in Jamaica, we do have a suite um, of programs that we offer for our students. Um, exciting for me to say that we have what we call accommodations. We do national assessments for placement of students to our system. And in our, in our country, we do what we call accommodation services for students. So students are assessed, and we have a special needs unit that reviews the psychoeducational report, and then students are provided with um, scribes, so that they are provided with monitors in that classroom, interpreters. We have students who are from different um, nation uh, nationals, and so we have to provide linguist persons for them. Um, we may have to do braille. Students who are visually impaired, we have big prints for them for national exams. So we have an entire suite for our um, students based on their assessments. In the normal school system, we operate what we call um, a proficiency pathway. So students are assessed by our national um, preliminary assessment activities and they, are, they do pullouts. And to support the pullouts, we have what we call um, pathway coaches at the high school level and within the central ministry we have diagnosticians, we have ex clinical psych and educational psychologists who also provide um, support for the primary schools predominantly to monitor the pull-out sessions and to do the mainstream support that our teachers need. A part of the support we provide for, for these students is also teacher training teacher building um, and parental support. We have to do a lot of community groups. The pandemic helped us to have a better reach because we had um, more persons gravitating to the technology and so parents were ready to come online and to offer more support and willing to, to get involved. It was more a shared space so people realized that I'm not alone and then we had a broader community reach and in the online space for our parents. So that grew tr tremendously over the years, you know. Um, in the high school setting, we have what we call student support pathway coaches. 
that we place in our high schools, again, based on our assessments where students may need individualized support. These coaches are trained in special education or in literacy um, training to assist with the numerous and literacy focus. And they work with teachers, co-teach, co-plan, and also pull-outs again at the high school level to support our students. So those are some of the activities. So we have, we have assessments, we have screening, we have placement, we have parental support. And the COVID also pushed us into doing accessibility tools for our students with special needs. So we had to transition some more literacy materials into spaces to provide for those who are visually impaired, who are blind, you know, who are, are hearing impaired. Um, we have to work with those who have the autism. Um, so a number of initiatives we have rolled out. Is it enough? No. Because I can tell you, coming out of the pandemic, more persons have become aware of what we offer as a ministry. And so we see the increase in demand. And so we had to partner with private sector. So in our public schools, we may not have sufficient spaces to accommodate students or, or the facilities to accommodate them. And so we have gone into partnership with 17 private educational institutions that are well equipped. And so we, what, we, what we do is purchase spaces in a sense. So we pay the cost of the education and place our students or the public school into those spaces whose parents could not afford it otherwise. And so that's another way that we are reaching our students with special needs. Okay. Let me add to that as well. Um, in our early childhood institutions, uh, well, this year for the first time, we were able to do an assessment of all our children who are four years old. And the assessment that's done there is for early literacy, early numeracy, and behavioral issues. And to the extent that um, children fall into that category where they ha are having issues with early uh, literacy, early numeracy, and behavioral problems, then they go another step to see if they have special needs. So a child could be struggling with early literacy, but it's because they have an undiagnosed problem. So we do that, we're, and, and we're beginning to uh, ensure that that assessment at age four is institutionalized in our system by way of having it in our budgets on an annual basis so that we catch it early. Um, if a child is having special needs problems, we catch it early, and we're able to make the necessary intervention. Um, I'm with the University Design Institute. I'm Tamara Webb. I will definitely say little because you'll be meeting with us on Friday and learning a little bit more. However, I wanted to say thanks to you for sharing about the increase of students who are wanting to stay in high school longer. That's very impressive. Um, either them or their parents <laughs> to move them there. With the University Design Institute, what we learned is that there are a lot of changes happening all around the world that's placing pressure on whether or not higher education is going to remain as relevant and attractive to people and family as we move on. The changes are happening digitally, the resource pressures, all of these things. With that one-third population of students at, in Jamaica who go, do you find that that's a stable number over time? And what are some of the kind of challenges or concerns you might be having for whether or not higher education is still going to be relevant to those thirds of your community as we move forward and go through all of these unprecedented changes in the world. All right, thank you for that question. Yes, um, traditionally, when you look at the numbers, yes, it's been about a third of those who graduate from high school. Um, part of the reason for that is the kind of high hurdle uh, that we set. Uh, those children, they have to pass at least five subjects mathematics, including maths and English, um, before they can get on that track to then go into tertiary. Uh, so what we have done with these, we call it um, the Sixth Form Pathways Program, these two additional pathways, is to say to the child who gets to grade 11, did not pass any subject or a few subjects, yes, we have something for you t as well, right? Um, traditionally, like I said, our students would just leave school at that, at that age and, you know, without um, uh, having passed a, a lot of subjects. And I, 
I can imagine how very demoted they must be feeling to see their peers going on and, and they are just kind of put out into the world to make their way. And so having created the Six Form Pathways program now, um, what we are seeing is a lot of interest from tertiary uh, because they realize that the additional two years, in those additional two years, those same students will become more mature. They could catch up on, on what they didn't get up to that point. And so it opens up a whole new world of opportunities for tertiary. But also, um, despite saying that, I know that our tertiary institutions have to really begin to look at themselves. The courses they offer, are they still relevant to the students? Um, are they flexible enough for the students? Are they still continuing that mode that they've been in for the last 60 years? Uh, those are some of the questions that they have to ask themselves and to begin to redesign uh, tertiary so that it can begin to attract those students. I think that's what they're going through right now because uh, when you look at the infrastructure of our tertiary institutions in Jamaica, it's way bigger than the number of students who pass through the gates. So there's a, a mismatch already. And um, a lot of our tertiary institutions depend on government financing, uh, a big part of it. So we're really calling on them to look at their offerings and look to see how, what changes they can make so that they can attract more of the students into tertiary um, to give us that leg up in terms of our workforce. Um, having a tertiary degree, it's, I mean, the percentage is really low right now. Um, you, know, I, you know, we're calling on them to really do that deep thinking and that relook at what it is that they do. You mentioned an important point of addressing quality of education as being one of your primary goals or dilemmas that you're dealing with. Uh, similarly, of course, I saw that as a crucial problem where much of the, develop, the donor community that was involved in Afghanistan focused predominantly, primarily on quantity, but very few elements of the donor community focused on quality. How in your administration or in your ministry do you address this issue of bringing quality of education as a primary concern, uh, particularly for those who are interested in working with your community? OK, thank you. Um, so if we start from early childhood, uh, the, you know, I mentioned earlier on of this age four assessment is to allow us, even at that early age, to uh, identify those children that have begun to have problems. And then you can see that if we consistently and religiously do that assessment year after year after year, we will be able to intervene in the lives of those children, right? So that by the time they transition to primary school, they'd be about age six, they'll be at a better level to enter primary school. And then all through primary school, you have additional intervention for those students. So then they're at a better level when they get to high school and so on. So it's, it's trying to identify the students at an early age and, and have those programs going so that um, you know, they c can begin to catch up as they move along rather than kind of what happens right now, they, they lose space, they lose you know, as they go along. And by the time uh, they get to grade nine in high school, especially our boys, we're seeing them drop out at age nine. And we want to reverse that trend um, you know, by, by starting there. But additionally as well, um, at our teachers' colleges for our new teachers coming in. Um, we want to sensitize them to this issue so they come in uh, with a, a new spirit, uh, you know, just thinking differently as to how to engage our students. We want to have more um, for our teachers who are already in service, uh, more professional development. And right now that is voluntary in Jamaica for our teachers. Um, we're moving to an environment in which that will be mandatory. Uh, um, you know, our teachers have to have 
uh, additional professional development. It's good for them in terms of their career, and it's good for our students in terms of them being in the classroom as well with our students. So that's how we're approaching it um, from kind of two different angles. And I have to add in, of course, um, our parents. We have a real push um, to get our parents more involved or more knowledgeable about what their children, uh, you know, what their child is learning in the classroom so that they can stay abreast. I know that's a mountain for us to climb, but it's one that we, we have to take the steps to climb that mountain to get our parents uh, more involved as well. Because we've seen in the schools in which you have strong parent-teachers association, in which parents come to parent-teacher, uh, you know, uh, meetings, um, where they come uh, for, the, for the teacher's day and all of that, we see the results and we, we know that it works. All over the world you see that. Um, and so we want to, to, to really get our parents to understand that and, and, and you know, enable them to become a more vibrant part of the education system to help their children to do significantly better. I'm more interested in knowing about the, the, the gadget per child policy. The, the laptop uh, is, I, I want to know how you are doing with that because with the introduction of all these gadgets, we have situations where they're misplaced, they're stolen, they are vandalized. So I want to know what your ministry or what the schools in Jamaica do to ensure the monitoring and the protection of all these gadgets. And I also want to know about the comment. Are your teachers accommodative of the, the in-service trainings that you're doing for, for the applications that they use with these gadgets? Thank you very much. I think our, our students are so excited to get devices that they really take care of them. We haven't had major issues. We haven't had issues with students reporting that they've lost their, their, their devices. Um, one of the things we made sure to tell parents was that if it was damaged or lost, uh, they would be responsible to replace them. Like the government is giving you one, uh, you know, to take through school, primary school or high school, and like if it's damaged or lost, it's the responsibility of the parents to replace it. And I think um, that has helped, um, helped us. Um, but it's because of. Jamaica, because of us being a developing country and we're not, we don't necessarily have access to all the resources that a country like the US would have. When a child gets a device, they hug that device and they really feel special and they take care of it. Um, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the case three, four, five years from now, but that's what we're seeing right now. In terms, I think your second question had to do with the in-service training of teachers, teachers who exist. Um, again, when we uh, got into the pandemic and realized that we had to go virtual, um, our teachers really, really stepped forward and were trained in the virtual space, and that's continuing. I know there's still a lot more that we can do, um, to help them know that they're back in the face-to-face -to, -face, to integrate technology in the classroom in a real way that would enrich the teaching and learning uh, experience. Um, but I, we, we didn't see any resistance on the part of our teachers to be trained um, in the virtual space. And it's for us now to just you know, ramp that up and take that to a different level. I just wonder something from uh, your speech. First of all, uh, you have uh, provided devices and access during pandemic as a wide lens, and 20% uh, of your budget is for education. And the finest thing is the additional two years high schooling. I am really wondered how is it possible and. Uh, you just, I just uh, listened from uh, others' question. You answered that you handled it very much uh, nicely. So, mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, guardians of rural area has less financial support to send their kids to 
in the score after pandemic. So what particular initiative did your government do to overcome this problem? In terms of the rural areas? Yes. We've made some provision in our budget for rural transportation, uh, but I have to say it's not nearly enough. Um, the number of students that we are able to help right now is about 7,500, uh, and we have at least 100,000 students that are in need of some transportation support. Um, unlike in the US where you have a national school bus system that, that, that takes children to school, uh, we don't have that in Jamaica, so parents have to provide transportation for their children, uh, it, you know, all over Jamaica, even in the city. But it's just that in the city, in Kingston, the transportation is extremely, extremely subsidized by the government. So it's not just such a big uh, expense for parents, but when you go out in the rural parts, it's very, very expensive relative to the budget that a family has. So. Um, We'd love to increase that allocation that we have in the budget uh, for rural transportation. But again, it's, you know, we operate within constraints and we just have to maximize on what we have. Uh, the question I have is about the gender divide in education and the, the fact that more and more young men are not reaching or falling behind women in terms of the education system. Not just in Jamaica, I think it's probably true globally. And to what extent is that perceived to be an issue? And to what extent are and what steps could be taken to address it? Because if you see a, a situation where 70% of the high school graduates are women or young or girls, um, that means that only 30% are, are men. That then becomes a longer-term problem uh, that could have social impact. Sure. Um, before I answer the question, let me say that during the Transforming Education Summit in New York, there were, there were many, many speakers spoke to the fact that there are many girls all across the world who are denied education. Um, but I was sitting there with Dr. Troop and we we're going, that's, that's not our reality. Our girls are, they have full access to education. Our reality is our boys they are way significantly behind our girls in their, in their learning. Um, you know, when you look at the numbers, by the time they get to grade nine in high school, many of them uh, are dropping out. And when you look at the reasons, high among the list of reasons is um, they don't see the benefit of school, they're bored. Uh, those are some of the reasons that they give. By the time we get to tertiary, we have 80% girls, 20% boys. So we really have a problem with boys in Jamaica. And so, interestingly enough, with the Sixth Form Pathways program, we're seeing more boys take it up because the pathways, the initial pathways that we have created are mainly focused on technical and vocational education, which we're pushing, which I believe our boys love more. It's hands-on. They get to do fun things in that. So what we have to do now is to ensure that we go deeper, um, start teaching those classes earlier on in the education system so that they are also engaged in, in classes. Um, Sometimes I, I, I hear boys talking and I just kind of listen and they're like, oh, you know, the teacher is expecting us to just sit and listen like the girls. But then, you know, we, you know, you know, they're more active. They want to do things. So it's up to us to really ensure that from an early age, we engage our boys uh, in a different kind of way than we do the girls too. And, and that, I believe that will encourage them to stay in school. I know that in the international realm, when you talk about the gender difference in learning, uh, sometimes they you know, say, oh, no, no, that doesn't exist. But in our experience, that is what we are seeing and that we have to cater for our boys to ensure that they at least keep pace with the girls or we're going to have a very lopsided society, a very lopsided workplace into the future. And so 
Um, I'm thrilled by these numbers that we're seeing of the boys who would not have gone on to tertiary. They are taking up the additional two years in high school and they are moving into the TVET space. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your questions. Uh, and again, we, we are so delighted to be here. Thank you for coming out this afternoon to, to hear about the education system in Jamaica. We hope to learn a little bit more. Thank you, ASU, for the hospitality. Um, it's been wonderful so far. Thank you so much. small token of our appreciation for providing your engagement in this public forum. So I'd like to present you with a small gift from ASU. Thank you again, Mr. Williams, and thank you for the delegation for being here over the next couple of days. We really appreciate this and the continued partnership between ASU and Jamaica. We're going to help out where we can.